grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Here I am, Lord. Uh, I was thinking about that earlier on the week when I knew that we were going to be singing that song. Probably out of the four installations where I've been installed as pastor, that was one of the songs. And so how fitting it is, I think, as... uh, well, we'll just call this an installation tonight of fishers of men and women. As I leave as your vacancy pastor, one of your vacancy pastors, I'm going to give you a few challenges. And they're based on Jesus calling his disciples to be fishers of men. You see, uh, God has called us into what I like to call net fishing. Uh, I am a fisherman. I like to bass fish, and uh, I saw a gentleman not too long ago, as a matter of fact, Bill Stock was in high school with him, and, and he reminded me that he and I had gone fishing, and I'd caught a very little fish. Now, if you knew who this was, you'd understand why he said that. I caught a five and a half pound bass, but he didn't like it, because he caught a little fish. So all he remembered was my catching a little fish. I like fishing. I'm not the first fisherman, though. And uh, neither was Peter. The first fisherman was God. You think about that just for a minute. He who created the creature that we call the fish is he who went out and sought Adam and Eve. Uh, Jonah wasn't the first fisherman. God was the first fisherman. And as he sends Jesus Christ into this world to take on flesh and blood to become a fisher of men, those that he called that day, he enabled them to go fishing. And he caught them with the good news of compassion, forgiveness. This wasn't the first time Peter, James, and John, and Andrew saw Jesus, by the way. This wasn't a freak accident. Now, they had watched Jesus. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his public ministry. They had some knowledge of him, but now he's asking to leave everything and go fishing for men and women. Now, I'd like to share with you that uh, net fishing is different than some other kinds of fishing. This net belongs to Don Near. Man, this thing is big. Uh, Yeah, you're not going to catch guppies with this one, okay? Okay. And uh, Ruth and I were in Israel. We were at the Lake of Gennesaret, which is, by the way, not really Gennesaret anymore. It's called the Sea of Galilee. But the reason they called it Gennesaret was it really wasn't a sea. It's not big enough. It's a lake. It's about seven miles wide and about 10 miles long, something like You can see across the lake. You can see uh, Lebanon. You can see not Syria. You can see Jordan all from this lake. So we went out there and and they casted a net to catch fish. And the guy that we were with us said that he had been doing this for like 12 years, I think. So he said, how many fish do you think I've caught in 12 years? Well, we were all guessing, a lot. And he said, seven. Now, if you know the story of fishing and the knowing story of Peter, you know why. Most of the fish that are caught in the Sea of Galilee are caught at night. At nighttime, the fish come up towards the surface. In the daytime, they don't like all that light, and they go deeper. And they get frightened when they see things throwing over the side of boats. So Peter and James and John and Andrew had been fishing all night and hadn't caught anything. We're going to come back to this net in just a little bit. But I want you to think about the three words that go along with net. Now, N, E, everyone for eternity. And T, the time is right. So first of all, now. Now is the time to cast your net. Think about this just for a minute. I want to put this in the perspective of Zion. I am not objective. I'll say that right up front. I do not believe that the era of Christianity and the church has to be gone. Get it out of your heads if that's what you think. Many of us, I shared this with my son the other day, I'm going to be preaching at a church in March later on that has 
and worship on a Sunday morning, two churches, a total of nine people. Look, I'm doing it in reverse. I started out St. Paul de Pere, <laughs> and it was a huge church. Then I went to Grinnell, Iowa. We started out with 50 and went up to about 100 in worship. And then I went to Abiding Savior. We started with about 50, and we went up to 900 in 11 years. And then I went to Tennessee that had 50, and we grew. The Lord bless us. And then I came here after a few other steps along the way. Now I get to go preach to nine people. One, two, three, four, five, six. The rest of you can go home. <laughs> I was talking to my son about this, and I shared with him that some pastors, like me and others, believe we are in a time of pre-evangelism. What that means is things in the world are going to get worse, and people will not know where to turn. And when they don't know where to turn, who knows where they should turn? God knows and God's people. And God's people have to be ready to go fishing. Just not then, but also now. So back, I did a little research. At the time of Jesus and, the, and he's telling Peter to, to go out and fish, there were probably four fishermen, Peter, James, and John, and Peter's brother, Andrew. In 1912, in Valley Park, there were eight families that formed Zion. Eight families. That was after a meeting in the home of Mr. Frank Mosbach. Anybody know that name, Mosbach? I'm sure Frank didn't talk very much. He was very quiet. Like, you know, you know somebody we know who's really quiet, don't we? Carl. And after they met for a year and a half there, the church got started. Maybe today we could echo Peter's sentiments. Here's what he said. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Somebody, when I did research and listening to other pastors, said, if you stop right there, you're in trouble. And many people do that. They say, well, we haven't done anything. We haven't gotten anything accomplished here. Let's just give up. But Peter didn't give up, did he? He goes on and says, but if you say so, we'll do it. Are you ready for that part here? I hope you are. And I'm not asking you to take giant leaps. I'm just asking you to take my baby step. But it's one step at a time. Knowing that the same person who empowered Peter empowers you. Some of us might say, we haven't caught anyone late. As a matter of fact, it's been a long time since, and you can fill in the blank. It's been a long time, Pastor, since the church has been full. Christmas Eve, I argued with Donnie before Christmas Eve, maybe a few days before. I wanted to take out these first pew, and you know this, the... Uh, Monastery rail because I thought we could have more room for what was taking place. Donnie said, what about if the church is full? Well, Donnie, you were wrong. This church has been full. Don't concern yourself about the pews. Concern yourself about the people. First, we need to be concerned about people before we do pews. We need to see in our own families, in our own setting, in our own sphere of influence, where someone needs the good news that Jesus Christ cares about them. We need to be fishing because the time is short. How do I know this? You all know it. My wife told me the other day, I was getting ready for, we won't get into the detail, but I had a colonoscopy. Anybody want to know the details? <laughs> this is being recorded, so I hope nobody there gets really excited. Carl, if you need to leave and go downstairs now, you can do that, okay? Uh, my wife says, remember, Jim, you know, be confident. Uh, we know how the book turns out. Right? The last sentence in the Bible, God speaks and says, the grace of God. Isn't that true for us today? It's still the grace of God in our lives. Here's what Jesus said. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Have you seen any? Any in South America? Any off the coast of Malaysia? It happens. God wants us to be aware. It's time may be short for the person without Christ. Jesus also says, Why do you say to yourself, Today and tomorrow we'll go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you know what was going to happen tomorrow? Ask Bill Stock last Thursday. If he knew what was going to happen tomorrow, thank God he didn't. I'm seriously. We none of us know. James says, "What is your life? Your, mist, your life is a mist that appears for a little while, and then vanishes." 
Who do you know that no longer will no longer hear the gospel of Christ? One of my favorite comedians was Robin Williams. What a great, he had a great gift. He was really gifted. But Robin took his own life. Robin's never going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know if he ever heard it before. It's too late if he didn't. Maybe it's a private figure whose name doesn't ring a bell with you, but it does with everyone else or with others. I told the story about being in Israel. Anytime you want me to stop, just let me know. I'm not going to. Uh, we were in Israel for about ten, seven days, and uh, it was great. We got to see all the great places, and we went to see the, uh, the place of the Holy Sepulchre and the 14 different stations of the cross. And one of those stations is a flat piece of marble where they say that Christ was washed before his burial, which is not true, by the way, but they represent that. So we get on the bus, headed back to uh, Tel Aviv to get on the plane, and there's a man sitting across from me. And we got a group of 16 people, and he says, uh, were you on a tour? Yeah, well, we got the name tags on. Yes, we were. Were you in Jerusalem? Yes, we were. Were you at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher? Yes. Can you tell me what that piece of marble is all about? So I shared with him what was going on there. And then I had an opportunity to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, his mother was Jewish and his father was Islamic. He lived in the United States. I said, when you get home, have you ever opened a Bible? He says, yeah, I, I've got a Bible somewhere. So I took him to several places in the Bible where he could look to see that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost sheep of Israel first. Whether or not he followed up, I don't know. But do you know why he was on that bus? Think about this. This will help you understand where God puts you. We had already been to Tel Aviv once to get on the plane. We had gone through security, a two and a half hour trip of security. And then after we had gone through security, we got to where the uh, Delta, was it Delta Airlines? Yes. And it said, flight canceled. Words you love to hear. And they said, we're going to try to get you on a plane at midnight to New York City. Well, we have good friends of ours that had iPads. We couldn't get from New York City to Atlanta. It wasn't going to happen. Well, the plane landed from New York City before, and, and the tires were not good enough to take off the next day. They had to fly to New York City to get new tires and fly back with the tires for our plane, which meant we went, to, went back to Jerusalem at 5.45 in the morning after being awake all night, had a day there, and this guy was on the bus when we went back. Isn't that interesting? You might think it's coincidence. I'm not so sure it was. Be aware that God puts you in places where you can speak the gospel by what your life is, what God's done in your life, and take them to Jesus Christ. E, everyone will spend eternity somewhere. What did Christ catch Peter with, and what did he catch with you? What did he catch you with? It was the gospel, the good news, the forgiveness of sins. Peter knew he was a simple man. It was a resurrection from the dead and his presence always. When Peter got out of the boat after the great catch of fish before the resurrection, you know what he did? He ran away. He said, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. That's what he knew about himself. We, too, are caught by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are caught by what happened on Good Friday. Yes, I know you know the Bible. Do you know how many people don't know the Bible? Don't know what it means that Jesus Christ is their Savior and Lord? Don't understand the word baptism? And I'll get a little personal here. Some of your kids and grandkids have forgotten what their baptism means to them. Or some of your kids and grandkids have been confirmed, and they don't ever think about the commitment they made. Do you remember what your commitment was? Be faithful. Hold to that faith. Who's praying for them? Yeah, I hope you are. And God promises to hear your prayers. I don't know how he's going to answer it, but he promises to hear it. You see, Christians see God's plan through the eyes of faith because we see Christ in his word. Peter saw Christ after the resurrection, and we see Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's Oliver. And I don't, Has Oliver been baptized? I could do it now. If you, okay, good. Just All right. Okay, good. I probably, well, we could do other things to him. 
Okay, Oliver is a free spirit. Okay, but Oliver needs Jesus just as much as anybody else, right? Okay, those that are not caught will be lost forever. That's what Scripture tells us. The T stands for trust Christ to go with you. He removes your fears. This is interesting. Peter and the other disciples knew something about Jesus before uh, he called them to be fishers of men, but they knew a lot more after the crucifixion and the resurrection. Now you all remember this story. After the resurrection, what did Peter decide to do? Go back and fish again. He went back to something he knew. And Jesus comes, has fish cooking for them on the shore side. Instead of running away, what does Peter do this time? He runs to Jesus. That's what it says. He jumped out of the boat and he ran to Jesus. Not only does he jump into the water, he goes towards Christ. Not only does that, he jumps into preaching. He preaches in Pentecost right away. Not only that, he jumped into proclamation. And Peter, we hear, he is patient with you, not want anyone to perish. That goes for us as well. And then because of the work of the Holy Spirit, he sends us, even though we are sinners, as the, as the Spirit goes with us. What this means is, and I, I just read this again uh, earlier before church. God, uh, how many of you know you have a brain? Just raise your hand if you know you have a brain. Uh, God really wants you to use it. And he wants you to use it for his kingdom work. I heard this in a sermon. I just think it's a great story. I made Bill laugh. So if it makes Bill laugh, it might make you laugh. Uh, there was a guy in New York City who went to a bank. He was going to go to a business meeting overseas. And he went to the bank. He said, could I borrow $5,000? Uh, I'm going to a meeting overseas for two weeks. I'll be back. And then I'll pay you back with interest. And the guy looks at him and says, well, what have you got for collateral? The guy think that, you know, you've got any value? He says, well, look out there on the street. There's a Rolls Royce. Is that enough? Well, yeah, that's enough. So the guy go, takes his business trip. He's gone for two weeks. He comes back. He comes in the bank. He lays down $5,000, $5,400.51. $5, that's the interest. And the uh, bank officer says, you know, sir, uh, we looked up your record and you've got millions of dollars. Why in the world would you want to borrow $5,000? He said, well, do you know anywhere in New York City you can park a car for $14.51 <laughs> for two weeks? Now, that cute story tells us that God gives us common sense, doesn't he? And a brain to use. Jesus said, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Sometimes we have not been wise and sometimes we haven't been harmless. God calls us out into the world to be compassionate. Take your net and carry it through as many doors as possible. This is another reason why I like this net. I've used this before. This is not the first time. But if you notice, uh, it really does form a lot of crosses. Every time, the, every time you see these knots, there's crosses everywhere. And all of you have been baptized. And when you were baptized... The sign of the cross on your forehead, upon your heart. You're not, you're not without power. You understand that? And what happens is God can use you. There are people who have said that during this past year and a half, they kind of enjoyed my being here. And I really do appreciate that. But I really hope, above all else, that Jesus Christ is the one that has been shared. And that you'll take with you. Because he wants to go with you into this world. He wants to go in, goes with you into the both buildings here. He wants you to reach out. Some doors are very public, like Adam Wainwright, who's a great Christian, and some are very private. Ruth and I were at Crackle Barrel the other day. Uh, we were, I don't remember exactly why. It wasn't Valentine's Day. You know, I'm a little bit better than that. I take her home for that. Uh, but we watch. We're sitting over here on this side of Cracker Barrel, and there's a, there's a chair here for us, and there's two men, one sitting by himself here and one sitting by himself there. Do you know how many people go out to eat in a restaurant because they're lonely and there's nobody around? Now, they ate big meals. I think that's probably their one meal a day. But 
Do you think there might be people in Valley Park that need the companionship of other people who can share with them Christ? What's that building for? I invited you all last week, or at least most of you, to go take a walk, a walk through both floors. And when you do, when you dig that walk, pray and ask God to show you what he wants to do. Don't tell him what he ought to do. We like to do that. Well, it's got to be a preschool. No, it doesn't. It might be adult daycare. It might be AA. It could be overcomers. It could be a, an exercise area for older adults. You want to live longer? Act like it. And exercise like it. And exercise with people who need to know Jesus Christ. Some are very private, yet they are not less important. Another true story. I heard this on a sermon today, but I thought it was really good. That's why I'm sharing with you. Are we got time yet? Yeah, we got time. A pastor friend of mine and I would tear shared the story, and he said, and it is a true story. This is a story about Kyle and Chris. <sighs> Kyle was a freshman in high school. And Kyle was leaving the high school building with a backpack full of everything and his arms full of stuff. And uh, Chris is across the way, across the street, and he sees Kyle being bullied. So he goes over and stops it. And he says, Kyle, hey, Kyle, is that your name? Yeah. Some of us like to play basketball. Would you like to come with us, play basketball? No. Well, come anyway. Chris was a Christian. He says, Kyle, there are some of us just like to get together and, and we just talk. Would you come with us the next day and talk? No, I really don't feel like it. We'll come anyway. Chris, the third day or the fourth day. Kyle, some of us just like to play cards. We don't play for money. We just play card games. Would you like to come and join us? No. We'll come anyway. Four years later, Kyle is the valedictorian of his class. And he gives up and he gets up and he gives his address. He says, I want you to know I would not have been here if I had not been for a Christian young man by the name of Chris. You see, the day he crossed the street, I was going home to commit suicide. Across the street, regardless of the age. Suicide is a very high rate for police officers. Do you know any police officers you could pray for on a regular basis? I know you know one. God's placing that before you. And I really believe he'll empower you. I really do. I want you to believe it too. Amen? Amen. And how may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the life everlasting. Amen.